Uh, hello and welcome to Scholars Hub at Home and thank you for joining us today. I'm Carrie Williams, Associate Director of Alumni Events at York University and I want to extend a warm welcome uh, to each of you uh, in our audience, whether this is your first Scholars Hub at Home uh, with us or you've joined us before. Uh, thank you and welcome to this week's event. This webinar is part of our Scholars Hub speaker series, which features timely and relevant educational lectures and, um, and sorry, educational lectures by academics and researchers from York. We're so pleased to be able to bring this series online to allow even more of our alumni community and community at large to hear from some of the university's leading scholars. Uh, before we begin, I do want to share a brief update about the fall semester. Uh, and York's response to COVID-19. As the university begins to plan for a gradual and phased return to our campuses, it is important to recognize the pandemic state of emergency is still in effect. Uh, York has joined all other GTA universities and many large organizations in supporting the City of Toronto's request to continue remote work until the fall of 2020. You may read uh, about the specifics to a phased return to campus and what that means over the next couple of months at the link that should appear on your screen now. Although we aren't all in the same location, we recognize that uh, many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York, York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of the many indigenous nations, of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably care and share for the Great Lakes region. Uh, now we'd like to take a quick poll asking, uh, have you ever attended a York University alumni event, either in person or online? Uh, it should pop up on your screen right now and I'll give everyone a moment to respond. Great. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So the majority, almost 70% of you um, have been here with us before. So that's wonderful to have you back. Uh, we're really appreciating the following that, that we've earned over the last couple of months. Um, and for those of you who are new to this, uh, welcome and we hope that you enjoy today. If at any point, especially if you're new to this, uh, if you need any help with Zoom, the Zoom platform, please feel free to click on the Q&A button on the bottom uh, of your screen and enter your question there. Our team is ready to help you. Uh, that same button can be used throughout the lecture to submit questions uh, for our speaker uh, as we will have a Q&A period following, following the lecture. And if you are joining us by Facebook, uh, you may enter your comments in the comment box there and the team will send them my way. Uh, later in this webinar, we'll be looking to, you, uh, looking to you for feedback on what topics you'd like us to cover for future Scholars Hub at Home events, so stay tuned for that. Now, uh, today's talk is titled Exploring the Summer Skies, Astronomy and Developments in Space Research at York, featuring Professor Paul Delaney, Department of Physics and Astronomy, Faculty of Science and Director of the Allen I. Carswell Astro uh, Astronomical Observatory at York University. Professor Delaney's primary research interest is variable stars and monitoring changes in the periods of some stars over several years, research that has improved our understanding of stellar evolution. As the director of the York University's Allen I. Carswell Observatory, he promotes the use of York's telescopes for research, education, and outreach, as well as small group tours and online public viewing. He is an expert on all topics space in astronomy and has been interviewed many times by the media. 
Welcome, Dr. Delaney. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. My pleasure, Carrie. Delighted to have everybody tuning in for uh, this midweek burst of astronomy. That's right. Okay, the floor is yours. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, as I said, glad to see you all here. So let me just uh, do the technical bit here and pop over to my shared screen so we can get this show on the road. Here we go. Hopefully, everybody can now see our title slide. So topical. That's the uh, name of the game here. It's summer. It's therefore warm and there's no excuse for anybody uh, to not be able to get outside and have a look at the night sky. Uh, you'll be able to do that both with the unaided eye, with binoculars, and I'll give a couple of uh, opportunities for you to uh, find objects telescopically if you've got a friend, neighbor, or your own telescope uh, lurking in the garage that hasn't uh, seen the night sky recently. I'm also going to give you a quick update on some of the really exciting space science activities that are taking place in real time, notably missions to Mars. So let's get ourselves underway here, shall we? Uh, okay, let's... Okay, ah, here we go, right. Uh, the ad always has to come up first. Uh, this is the opportunity for you to uh, catch us after today's event. Now, normally, of course, I would invite you up on a Wednesday evening to tour the facility and have a look through our telescopes. Can't do that at the moment. But nonetheless, on Monday and Wednesday evenings, you do in fact have the opportunity to meet with uh, members of my team, to be able to ask questions about uh, astronomy uh, in a virtual capacity. And so I will direct you to the observatory.info.yorku.ca web address because there you can find out all about our Monday night activities and our Wednesday night activities as well. And if you really would like to uh, hear literally more about us, uh, we have our own radio show called York Universe, which is on astronomy.fm. So it's online radio for you as well. So lots of opportunities for you to catch up on astronomy through the observatory after today's event is concluded. And uh, if you are going to be able to make it up in the fall or the winter, we don't know when we're going to be able to have in-person tours again at the facility, but sooner than later, we hope, we certainly will give you the opportunity for that Galileo moment to have a look through our new one meter class telescope. It's the largest optical telescope on any university campus anywhere in Canada. And it's a real delight to use and for you to uh, see splendors of the night sky and you can see it up there in the top left hand corner okay end of ad <laughs> okay it's comet season it seems everybody i'm sure has heard about comet neo wise and i'll give you a, a quick refresher on how you can find the comet in our evening skies but Comets in general are really wonderful objects, and we find two to three dozen new comets every single year. So the fact that everybody is talking about Comet Neowise, to astronomers, not particularly unusual. The last really bright comet that uh, graced our skies was Comet Ison back in uh, 2013. And you can see some images here, the top right-hand image taken by one of the observatory team members, uh, Richard Block, and then the uh, left-hand side of this image, uh, an image from one of the major observatories in South America. Uh, comets are beautiful. They are small, rocky objects, tend to be only a few kilometers in diameter, but as they come in towards the sun, towards what we call perihelion, uh, they get heated. And in the process of being heated, the rock matrix begins to release volatile materials, gases, if you will, uh, water vapor, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane. That material begins to literally explode out of the rocky matrix, which is the nucleus of the comet, and then it streams behind behind the comet and creates these beautiful tails. So comets are really fascinating objects. They are time capsules. They talk to us about the earliest formation moments of our solar system, but when they come in close to the sun and they get heated, they are able to release a lot of those secrets. So astronomers always find comets a wonderful object, or wonderful objects to be able to observe. So this was Comet Ison back in 2013. Now, you're probably sitting there going, why didn't I see it? Well, unfortunately, the main reason you didn't see it is that it didn't survive its perihelion pass with the sun. This is a series of images, it's an animated GIF, from the SOHO satellite, NASA's satellite, which has been monitoring the sun and its nearby environs now for oh, over 20 years. And it's picked up something like 3,000 comets itself in that 20-year lifespan. Well, here you can see 
Comet Ison. It's sweeping in from the lower left-hand corner of this image. It heads towards that disk in the center, which is actually an occulting disk because the sun is very bright. And you will see that what happens when it comes out the far side, it has disintegrated. When comets pass too close to the sun, they can be gravitationally tidally disturbed or destroyed. And while Comet Ison showed great promise for a really bright comet and therefore a terrific show for us here on Earth, it did not survive its close pass with the sun. This is very common. They are referred to as sun grazing comets. If they get too close, uh, they literally just get destroyed. If they don't pass very close to the sun, then they don't get heated as much and then the tail is much shorter. So it's sort of uh, this problem. If it gets too close, then it gets heated really well and we get a really long tail and potentially a really bright object to look at. But in fact, if it is too close to the sun, it can get destroyed. So ISON never made it into our evening skies. It never made it to really great naked eye visibility. Fast forward to today. Comet NEOWISE, again found by a spacecraft by the name of NEOWISE, one of NASA's uh, many satellites that are observing the night sky for us, uh, found NEOWISE, this comet, in late March of this year. It looked as if it was going to hold great promise, and so astronomers were looking at it carefully and predicting, and comets are notoriously difficult to predict what they are actually going to do, uh, but we suspected this was going to become a naked eye comet. But we didn't get too excited because we knew it was going to pass very close to the sun on July 3. So close that we really expected another comet ISON type experience. So we kept expectations low, not just for ourselves, but for you as well. Well, surprise, surprise, and as I said, comets are fickle. It survived its close pass with the sun and it burst into the morning sky on July 4th. And everybody was truly amazed at how bright it was. This is a cometary image taken by one of my colleagues in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Toronto Centre, Ian Wheelband, he managed to image it very early in July. And as you can see on the left-hand side of this image, it's not only just a point source, but a beautiful tail stretching ver vertically away from the horizon. And everybody on the planet has now become aware of Comet Neowise. It's a really great object to look at, and even better, it's in the evening sky now. How can you find it? Okay, wait till about 10 o'clock local time, Eastern time here, or about an hour after your local sunset, and look towards the northwest area of the sky. It's now the better part of 20, 25 degrees, so that's a good hand span above the horizon and climbing higher. And in fact, it's got a terrific signpost, the Big Dipper, Ursa Major over there in the Northwest sky. Uh, and that is visible to almost anybody, including those of us who live in light polluted Toronto. Uh, if you can find the Big Dipper just to the lower left, you will be able to find Comet Neowise strongly recommend a pair of binoculars uh, because that sort of you know gives you uh, added depth added capability for being able to pick out slightly fainter objects neowise is naked eye but if you've never seen a comet before let alone the tail which does get quite faint and diffuse then the binoculars will assist you greatly in finding it so look for Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, its tail, the handle of Ursa Major is standing pretty well straight up at the moment. And then to the lower left, you should be able to see Neowise. Scan carefully around. And then once you've found it, it'll be easy to find it every other night thereafter. Drink in the site. You know, have a good look at it. Don't just sort of go in for 15, 20 seconds. And that, because the more you look at it, the better your dark adaptation becomes, the more detail of this comet you are going to see. Uh, it is photographed uh, by uh, cell phones, although most cell phones don't keep their uh, sort of their shutters open long enough to get you a decent image. I certainly do encourage you to try. I did manage to succeed in doing it, but it's not nearly as good as, for example, uh, Ian Wilpen's uh, image. And if you go online, you'll find Sky and Telescope, Sky News, all sorts of agencies are publishing many, many images of neo -wide. Have a shot at trying to photograph it yourself, but my best recommendation is a pair of binoculars and just drink in the sight. And from day to day, over the next two to three weeks, because it should stay visible in binoculars easily for the next two to three weeks, climbing ever higher in the Northwest sky, uh, you will see changes in the comet's tail. It will begin to get a little shorter. It mightn't get as uh, uh, obvious to you, uh, shall I say, because it will be getting fainter, but 
comets do change unexpectedly. So keeping an eye on this over the next couple of weeks, strongly recommended. Really nice sight, Comet Neowise. Okay, by the time we get to August, it's Perseid meteor shower season. And again, we don't need uh, telescopes to be able to see meteors. Meteors are basically small pieces of rock that are flying around our solar system, get caught by the gravitational field of the Earth and get sucked in, dragged into our atmosphere. And then courtesy of the speed that they are moving, literally generally tens of kilometers a second, they burn up in the upper atmosphere with friction. Okay, so the object, hits the upper layers of our atmosphere. And as the air gets thicker and thicker, the friction with the material basically uh, ablates the object entirely with a burst of energy, which is normally visible. So here is a, a nice image uh, from the Perseid meteor shower. I think it was 2019 from Northern Europe. These are generally speaking spectacular sites if you can get yourself into a nice dark location. It is visible even in the city. Uh, however, the darker the site that you can uh, obtain, the more fainter meteorites, oh, sorry, meteors you will be able to see. And potentially some of these meteors do actually come to ground and become meteorites. So this is the sort of uh, uh, spectacle that can be viewed sitting down, lying down uh, after midnight on August 11, 12, 13, somewhere in there towards the east, northeast sky, Obviously, you don't want trees and houses in the way. The clearer the horizon, the better. And all the way up to the top of the sky, the zenith. If you can get yourself nice and comfy outside for about half an hour, midnight or later, if that's practical for you in these warm summer nights, that's easy. Have a look at the Perseid meteor shower. Definitely a spectacular display. You can see up to 60 meteors and uh, 60 meteors an hour. So that's one a minute throughout the peak on August 12th. Strongly recommend the uh, display. What's causing it? Going to come back to comets. This was a comet by the name of Swift Tuttle that disintegrated, you got it, courtesy of gravitational tidal forces, stresses, courtesy of its close pass by the sun. And now this sort of debris train, this rubble train is in the original orbit of the comet around the sun. And every August 12 or 13, the earth passes through that rubble train and this sort of debris sprays into our upper atmosphere and creates the meteor showers. This image that you can see here, courtesy of Sky and Telescope, is sort of trying to give you that three dimensional feel in, in 2D. Okay, so you can see the earth's orbit around the sun. We go once around the sun every year. And even though it looks like we might be crossing this debris trail a couple of times during the course of the year, remember that the comet's orbit is not in the same plane as the Earth's orbit around the sun. So in fact, there's only one moment in time around August 12, 13, where we run across this debris train. The sun, of course, is at the heart of a lot of what we're talking about here. These are comets that spin around the sun. And if they survive their pass, their brush with the sun, that's great. If they don't pass uh, too close to the sun, then they can live for a long period of time and we get these nice, nice long tails. But the sun, of course, is generating lots and lots of other activity, including what we call the solar wind, charged particles that stream out throughout the solar system. Uh, this is what gives rise to space weather. Why do I mention space weather to you? Because of course, another thing that you can see when you're out and about looking for Comet near Hawaii's, looking for the Percy of Media Shower, if you look towards the north, you might be lucky enough to catch an aurora. That's where this charged particle stream from the sun interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. Those charged particles get brought into the upper atmosphere. They collide with gases in the upper atmosphere and they give rise to light displays that are absolutely stunning. The further north you can be, the better the chance you will have of seeing aurora. Now, there's no guarantee on any given night, even if you are a long way north, that you will see the aurora. They are truly unpredictable, but we are beginning to ramp up solar activity, meaning that the chances to see aurora are increasing. So while you're out looking for Comet Neowise, looking for the Perseid meteor shower, keep an eye on your northern horizon to see whether or not you see these shimmering dancing curtains of light. Aurora displays are absolutely stunning. And again, you can have a shot at uh, imaging them, but trust me from experience, oh, it's really hard to get a good photograph of the aurora. Leave it to the experts. Okay, so you're outside, you're enjoying the night sky. Looking up, you will see three bright stars, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. 
part of the three constellations that make up the summer triangle. This is the constellations of Lyra, Cygnus and Aquila. Very hard to see the actual constellations, let alone the outlines that are the harp, the, um, the, the, the swan and the eagle. Nonetheless, the three stars that I've just cited, Vega, Deneb and Altair, they should be readily visible to you. And unlike the image that you're seeing here on the screen, because the uh, Earth is rotating on its axis, at this time of the year, the summer triangle is basically straight overhead, neck craning. So if you look straight up after you've been outside for five to 10 minutes, the brightest star that you will see at the top of the sky, that will be Vega. Heading towards the eastern horizon, a good hand span away from Vega, that's when you'll catch Deneb. And then if you move literally perpendicular to that line towards the southern horizon, again, you will be able to pick up Altair. Those are the three brightest stars that you will see uh, in the night sky straight overhead at this time of the year. So around about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. The Summer Triangle is full of wonderful objects. We do not have time to go through them all here. But first things first, find the Summer Triangle, find those three bright stars, and now you can tick off three of the 88 constellations that you know where they are. You will have found Lyra the Harp, Cygnus the Swan and Aquila the Eagle. If you have somebody who's got a telescope, you can have a closer look at the Ring Nebula inside Lyra. It's just a little bit south of uh, Vega and it is a beautiful, so I think of it as a, as a smoke ring or a Tim Hortons donut. Uh, it's really a beautiful sight, even in a fairly modest sized telescope. You don't have to have a really big one, but you won't be able to see it with the naked eye or a pair of binoculars. This is truly a telescopic object, one that we normally feature showing at the uh, observatory. Uh, and this, in fact, image was taken by members of the observatory team, not with our one meter telescope, actually, but with our 40 centimeter telescope. Beautiful, beautiful sight if you can gain access to a telescope while you're moving around the night sky. Over to the south southeast, there are two bright planets visible. The largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, and you've probably already seen it. It is early in the evening sky now in the southeast, by far the brightest object in the sky in the evening, with the exception of the moon. Uh, you need to see this type of the features here, the great red spot and the various cloud systems, you'll need a telescope for that. But it's easy to find Jupiter and see it move with respect to the other stars from night to night. You can see that inside binoculars very easily. To the right of it and uh, a little bit lower to the horizon, right, you'll see Saturn, the second largest planet in the solar system, the ring system. The image on the left actually was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. The image on the right was taken by the Cassini spacecraft from NASA. Two beautiful planets. To see their true spectacles, you do need a telescope, but you can keep an eye on them with binoculars and indeed your, your own eyes uh, without telescopic or binocular aid over there in the southeast. It is truly uh, the summer of these two planets. They are high in the sky when it's nice and warm. Uh, if you know somebody who's got a telescope, go make friends with them because these are two wonderful planets to look at. Okay, so that's what you can see around the night sky, but if you're keeping an eye on space science, and York is famous for space science uh, over there in the Lausanne School, the Space Sciences Program, Mike Daly, Jim Whiteway and company, they are really engaged in lots and lots of activities. Too many for me to tell you about, so let me just give you a quick heads up with respect to the planet Mars. Everybody loves Mars. That's the planet that we keep going to, to try and find signs of life. And the images that you see on the screen at the moment give you a bit of a sense of some of the terrific features, the volcanoes, the rift valleys that exist on Mars. And it's no question, it's decidedly red. It, it's well named the red planet. We keep sending spacecraft there. We've been doing it for over 50 years. Mars is a hard planet to get to. In fact, space in general is tough. It requires great resilience uh, and a near uh, perfection in terms of the, the spacecraft that you're sending there. Here is sort of a little, a little bit of a NASA anecdote from around about 2000, the year 2000. By that point in time, we'd sent about 40 spacecraft towards Mars and only 15 of them have been successful. And so if you think of this in terms of, you know, like a baseball batting average, it's about 385 or thereabouts. Not real good. 
Since this time, things have improved dramatically. The score at the moment is a little bit more in our favor, okay? We've gotten much better, much greater success in going to Mars over the last uh, 20 odd years. We can fly by, we can go into orbit, we can go onto the ground with rovers and landers, but it still is tough. The image that you see there, in fact, is a new crater on the surface of Mars, courtesy of the European Space Agency's Schiaparelli mission back in uh, 2018. Unfortunately, it was trying to land and it didn't succeed and it exploded on impact. Longer story, you've got to have resilience and perseverance when it comes to going to Mars. So we keep going there because it is such an exciting location to visit. These were some of the first images back in 1976 from the Viking landers, the first image in fact from the surface that was fully received here on Earth you see in the lower right hand corner and in the left hand top left you see the real surface of Mars. Very rocky, very sandy terrain and a very brown, orange, muddy nights, uh, daytime sky. No blue skies here on Mars. We keep going there because we believe that there was once a lot of water on Mars. We see uh, symbols of that on the surface today. Erosions of uh, 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 river deltas, uh, down cliff faces. We see dampening on the surface during the day, which talks to us about the melting of subsurface ice. So Mars was once a very wet, moist environment. Not today, though. We've sent lots of rovers to the surface. This was the Opportunity rover that lasted for like about 14 years and drove nearly 46 kilometers around the surface of Mars, exploring differing areas on the surface to give us a better understanding of the geology of Mars. There's been terrific successes on Mars to date. New York University was instrumental in the Phoenix mission that went to the North Polar regions of Mars back in 2008. And you see in the lower right hand image there, sheets of ice beneath the lander, which we were able to scrape uh, with our uh, robotic arm and determine that it really is water. We're not talking about sort of dry ice or frozen carbon dioxide. We're talking about real ice water, uh, well water ice, excuse me, which if we scraped together and you know, went inside our spacecraft and melted that, you could drink. So there is no question that Mars has had hospitable environments in the past. And it even snows on Mars. This was an image that was captured using our LIDAR instrumentation, built, designed and built at York University. Uh, and there were clouds above the Phoenix landing site there back in 2008. Clouds are quite regular on Mars. And we were able to watch the streaming ice snowflakes coming from the cloud heading towards the ground. No, you can't ski on Mars. It doesn't really reach the ground. It doesn't really accumulate, but that doesn't mean that it can't form in the atmosphere and fall towards the ground, just like snow. A very Canadian discovery, if you will, with Canadian instrumentation on the surface of Mars back in 2008. So there've been many generations of rovers onto Mars. You see in the lower left-hand corner there, the Pathfinder mission that was about the size of a microwave oven on wheels. And over on the right-hand side, you see Curiosity, the current rover running around the surface of Mars and almost a twin of the Perseverance rover that is about to be launched by NASA in the coming weeks. I'm not going to go through the harrowing excitement of getting a space probe to the surface of Mars because it truly is seven minutes of terror. You're going from 21,000 kilometers an hour to zero safely in seven minutes, all on autopilot because you know Mars is so far away, you can't control that landing yourself. It's all on autopilot. As I say, seven minutes of terror, and that happens every time we send a spacecraft down to the surface of Mars. But we've gotten much better, as I said, over the last 20 years. This is Curiosity on the surface of Mars. It's about the size of a small minivan uh, and it is roving around uh, a place called Gale Crater and climbing uh, a mountain that is about five kilometers tall. It's called Mount Sharp. So uh, at the moment Curiosity is doing its best impression of a mountain goat. And why are we doing that? Because we want to better understand the climatic changes that have taken place on Mars over the last four billion years and no better way to do that to than to look at differing types of rock that have been deposited over that four and a half billion year period. 
What's up next? Well, we've got three missions going to Mars this year. In fact, one has already launched. The United Arab Emirates has launched a uh, atmospheric probe called HOPE. It's going to be monitoring the atmosphere from orbit. It launched earlier this week on July 20th, and it will arrive in February of next year. China is about to launch, we think tomorrow, the Taiwan 1 orbiter, lander and rover. This is a very sophisticated mission. And if uh, China is successful, both the UAE and China will be the next countries to actually successfully engage in Mars exploration. And then come July 30th, we're talking about the cousin to Curiosity. This is the Perseverance rover, an even more sophisticated rover that will be on the surface searching very specifically for signs of life. So stay tuned for that. That is a July 30th launch. Uh, we were going to have a fourth mission launched. This was from the European Space Agency. Unfortunately, they could not make the deadline. You can only fly to Mars every 26 months. So the uh, Rosalind Franklin, also a vehicle very similar to Perseverance, that will be launching in 2022 and landing on Mars in 2023. Lots of space science happening. And as I said, uh, we will be a part of that here at York University. All of this, of course, is leading up to a landing on Mars in the not so distant future with people. Whether or not it'll be a NASA, SpaceX, or an international consortium, my money is on the latter. We are talking about being on Mars with people in the next 10 to 15 years. We should be back on the moon within the next three to four years. This is a really exciting time for human exploration of the inner solar system. So stay tuned for all of the excitement from NASA, from the Japanese Space Agency, from China, from the Indian Space Agency, from the European Space Agency, all eyes are on the inner solar system at this point in time. So on that note, I will stop and uh, hand it back to uh, Kerry to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Delaney. That was, that was really, really interesting. Um, we have lots of questions from our audience. Um, now, just a reminder to the audience, if you are watching by Zoom, uh, use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Uh, and if you're on Facebook, submit them through the comment box and, and we'll get them. Okay, uh, so let's start with, uh, gosh, there's lots of questions are coming in around, you know, can I see this from downtown? How can I see it? So I thought maybe one of the first questions we could start with was, uh, because you said so many times, get a good pair of binoculars. What would be a good pair of binoculars to use for checking out these sites? And, and where can I find it? Because I'm not going into any stores. So <laughs> how can I find binoculars? <laughs> right. I guess I can be glib and say any pair of binoculars you have in the house will work just fine. Okay. So you don't need to have a specialized pair of binoculars. Seven by 35s will work just fine. Eight by 50s. Any pair of binoculars that you have should work well. Um, so what you want to do in any location, okay, be it in the city or be it outside, obviously the darker the site that you can find happily and safely, the better the view is going to be. But you can see Comet Neowise from downtown Toronto. Just mm -hmm. don't try and look for it underneath a street lamp, okay? Uh, you've yeah. got to get away from the immediate brightness of light. So if you've got access to a backyard, just fine. Northwest horizon, as I said, about 25 degrees above the horizon, Use binoculars, any pair of binoculars. Uh, if, if you have to order a pair of binoculars online, do it from a telescope supply store. Uh, there's a group um, called um, uh, the Kitchener Waterloo Telescope Store. Old eyes, new skies here in Toronto. You know, uh, uh, Khan Scope Center just outside of the uh, Yorkdale Mall. Go online to any of these places. You should be able to find yourself a fairly inexpensive, as in yeah, hundred dollars or thereabouts, pair of binoculars. Uh, if you haven't got one at the moment, but truly, any pair of binoculars that will work well. Northwest sky, get fully dark adapted. Be safe, be comfortable, and yeah, from downtown Toronto, even you will be able to see this comet. Great. You know what? The timing of this is perfect. We're all home. So, you know, and it's summer. So yes. this is this is great. Question from Claudio uh, Gina Carey. Uh, what is the Higgs field and why is it important? Oh, gosh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
All right, okay. The, the, the quick answer to the Higgs field is it's associated with the Higgs particle. It's a Higgs boson particle that we finally detected uh, with the Large Hadron Collider back in 2012 or 2013. We've been looking for it for a long time. It was sort of that missing particle associated with the standard model. The short answer is it is what allows matter to exist with the characteristics that you and I experience. So everything that you can hold, people, objects, even the air molecules that you're breathing have mass. It's a fundamental intrinsic quantity. It's an intrinsic aspect of material in the universe. Uh, in contrast to you know, other uh, particles that, you know, leptons and, and so on, dark matter, dark energy, these are differing aspects of you know, the way the universe operates. But the Higgs field is what allows for particles to possess mass, this intrinsic quantity that you know, literally you and I and everything around us experiences. Going beyond that, we need slightly longer time or a course. <laughs> but okay. it basically, it's basically what allows particles to possess the intrinsic quality of matter. Okay. Okay. Claudio, Sorry. I hope that answered your question. No, that, that's good. That's good. Um, we have a question from Jupiter Jones. Uh, what are the implications of having a 1, 1M telescope comparatively to the 60? Will this impact the type of research the department does or just enhance it? Like, so furthermore, seeing, does it open more doors and opportunities as opposed to being limited to the 60? and higher to Jupiter. Not a problem there at all. The one meter opens up vastly more opportunities, not just for research, uh, because it's got a greater reach, it's got a greater field of view. This telescope sets absolutely exquisitely and it tracks perfectly. So our research opportunities do expand. We're about to put a spectrograph on this telescope that will open up the whole realm of spectroscopy, not just photometry, which we are currently doing with this telescope. So we'll be able to dissect objects and be able to tell what the material is that objects are made of. We'll be able to tell how fast they are and so on. But from a student point of view, and I'll now mention our second year class that goes galaxy hunting every year, uh, our 2070 class, the ability to reach fainter objects and to be able to take truly awe-inspiring images uh, is now readily available. Our second year class, when they were using the 60 centimeter telescope or our 40 centimeter telescope, they struggled a little bit to be able to identify faint objects like galaxies. They were successful, but it often took them the better part of an evening because, you know, they're novice observers. They're not quite sure what they're looking at. The telescope wasn't necessarily pointing as well as we would like. This is the 40 or the 60. And as a consequence, it was more of a struggle for our second year class and consequently our third and fourth year classes to be able to collect the data that they needed to be able to do the sort of the, their class projects. The telescope acts as a laboratory for our astronomy classes. The one meter telescope cuts through all of that. And our second year class was able to go in and within two hours collect awe-inspiring images. And they were just so excited. They all of a sudden had images as their backgrounds right on their, on their computer screens. So from a student point of view, these telescopes offer them the opportunity to be far more successful, to be able to do more science with the images that they were able to capture and just have a more well-rounded experience. Even our first year class, we were able to show them stunning images of the moon and be able to give them images that they could take away with them, do their analysis and keep those images just afterwards. So from the student perspective, it's a huge, huge improvement. From a research perspective, perspective we're all just salivating at the uh, use of the telescope. Uh, uh, another question from Jake Brooks. Uh, what are the main financial drivers motivating private sector travel to Mars and the moon? Sort of referencing sort of where you ended. Space, space tourism is probably the, the first thing that comes to mind. 
uh, because let's face it, you know, people like to travel, or well, they did before the pandemic, and I'm hoping that they will like to travel again after the pandemic. Uh, and to go into Earth orbit is the, the goal of space tourism. We've already had a number of space tourists who have gone into orbit over the last 20 years, and groups like Virgin Galactic, as well as SpaceX, are, are working really hard to be able to take you and me at affordable costs, although they're not terribly affordable at the moment, but at affordable costs into low Earth orbit. Orbit. The next obvious place to take people is to the moon. Uh, and in fact, SpaceX has already got a mission planned for around about 2023 uh, to be able to take uh, about eight to 10 artisans around the moon. Uh, so there is space tourism and the possibility of, you know, settling on these objects, although that's not going to happen uh, for you and me any time in the next decade or two. But there are also uh, the, idea, the notions of mining. I mean, you know, the Moon as well as Mars both have raw materials that are very similar to Earth. Not fossil fuels, okay? We, neither of these places have had significant amounts, if any, uh, forms of life. So we're not talking about fossil, fu fossil fuels here, but we are talking about precious metals and uh, the ability to be able to extract them from these environments is something which many organizations uh, are actually looking at. We're looking at mining asteroids. So there are financial opportunities here that uh, the private sector is very interested in, Moon first, Mars second. Science, of course, wants to be able to go to these places to be able to, to extend our reach and our understanding of how planetary objects form. And so the Moon and Mars uh, really have opportunities across a broad spectrum of uh, organizations. Okay. Thank you for that. You know, we do have lots of questions from the audience, but we're actually at time. Um, so I know it, it's there's there's a lot to talk about, but really uh, so appreciative of, of you joining us today. And you've given us some some key things to look for. Uh, uh, Norwise, the the summer triangle in August, the meteor like it, it's great. So um, given that the summers are, are not that you wait till the summers are like to do something like this, but the summers are like because we're not going anywhere. And so it's really, really, really quite timely and helpful. So thank you. You're welcome. And for those folks who didn't get a, a question answered, pdelaney at yourq.ca, send me an email. I'm, I'm happy to sit down and answer those questions. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you You're for welcome, that. You're welcome, Kerry. Okay. Um, so uh, before we say goodbye today to our audience, um, we just want to thank you again for taking the time to join us. Uh, as I had mentioned at the beginning, we do want your feedback. Uh, we have one last question for you, and this question really helps inform our events moving forward and how we tailor them for you. And the question is, what top topics would you be interested in learning about via Scholars Hub at Home? Uh, please just use the, uh, the Q&A box and enter in your topic uh, if you're using Zoom. If you're on Facebook, just respond in the comment section and we'll collect them from there. Uh, thank you so much for participating in that. Um, feel free to share today's talk with your friends, uh, especially those of you who maybe didn't get your questions answered. You want to follow up, please feel free to do that. Uh, we'll be posting this uh, on our York Alumni YouTube channel. Uh, you may also join our LinkedIn group and follow us on Facebook by searching York University Alumni uh, and follow us on Instagram and Twitter uh, by using the handle at York Alumni. Feedback about this or any of our programming is most welcome and necessary uh, and it can be sent to us via our social channels or just email us at alumni at yorku.ca. And thanks to the popularity of this series and the feedback we received from, from yourselves and our audience, Scholars Hub at Home will continue throughout the summer uh, every other Wednesday at 12 noon. Uh, so please join us on August 5th, 5th when we return with uh, Dr. Uh, Sylvia Vasquez Olegwin uh, from the Faculty of Environmental Studies to learn more about York's Malcoa Community Garden and food security. So more information coming on that soon. Hope to see you on August 5th. Thank you so much and be well.